Hello, all my friends in the Jinx world. It is Wednesday. That means it's hump day. And you know what that means? That means it's hump day happy hour time with Dennis in the know. This is your backstage pass for current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. It is live and it's over a little cocktail, whatever that beverage of choice uh, may be for you. Uh, for me tonight, it is, uh, it's a little bit of a bourbon kind of night. I'm, I'm feeling that bourbon vibe tonight. So we'll, we'll see what JB's doing, but you know, I do this with some of my best friends in the entire world, some great dentists and some great people. One of them isn't here tonight, Dr. Chad Duplantis. Uh, he is actually at the ADA. Oh, I want a big head. How did you get a big head and I don't have a big head? Nice. That's a good looking head. Look at I this like little that. hair that it cut out right I know. There. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Like a little tail. Got a little bit of mullet. Yeah. Who doesn't, who doesn't like a nice piece of who tail? <laughs> you know, our friends are always here. So we just we have him just sitting here watching us. That is Awesome. Well, Chad, unfortunately, is already at the ADA because he's uh, at SmileCon because he's lecturing tomorrow. Right. Uh, and then JB and I will be catching up with him down there because we're going to be podcasting uh, from SmileCon. We're really excited. If any of you are out there, we want you to come by, stop and see us. Uh, we'll be podcasting for the morning uh, on Saturday. So we'd love for you to come by, catch up with us, or even look for us on Friday because you might be able to talk us into a cocktail or uh, a conversation of some sort. But anyway, um, we are so happy to be with all of you, um, Dr. Jennifer Bell and myself. We have a great guest tonight. Uh, one of my favorite people in dentistry, Dr. Lon McRae, is with us tonight. Uh, he, he, he's really a guy who has just reinvented dentistry, and, and I can't say enough about him. And I'm so excited that he's on the show with us tonight. And, um, and, and we're just going to have a fun chat. We've been friends for a long time, and, and uh, you'll never meet a nicer guy in the industry or a better clinician. So excited to have him tonight. But as you know, our job is to bring all of you in the know. So that's what we're going to do. All right, let's talk some news. Jeff, here's a story you might find interesting, and maybe you can provide a counterpoint. So I saw there was a study that was released out of the Journal of Stomatology, Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. They took patients with TMJ degenerative disease and did an injection of a bone marrow aspirate concentrate into the space. And after one year, they had repair that held versus uh, traditional therapies like hyaluronic acid, which had a, um, had a, a rate that, you know, it, it definitely had a rebound rate to it. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. What do you think? Very interesting. Obviously there's going to be a uh, growth factor, you know, bone morphogenic yep. protein, uh, so it, it's not surprising that there's going to be some healing in there. But, you know, again, it, it boils down to what is the disc condyle relationship. If that disc is Correct. still too far away and, and we still have a bone on bone, even though, you know, we may get some um, regenerative effect, we, you know, we're, we're not really growing new disc where... Yep it's not happening. So, you know, it, it, I think what we'll end up seeing is that while it may be as good as any other temporary measure to alleviate pain, I'd be very surprised if we saw long-term results with that. Now, that in combination with maybe some repositioning or that in combination with some non-invasive surgery or or other techniques, I think we'll really see the benefit. Well, and I like I always like moving towards therapies that are autogenous. Absolutely. You know, as opposed to putting 
cortisone in there or, you know, some other type of uh, destructive or hundred you know, percent artificial. With you more. So I like where that direction is headed. And I, I love the idea because, you know, too, there are patients that want palliative care and there are patients that want treatment. And so it is nice to have tools in the toolbox um, to maybe be able to provide healthy options. Cause I do know if you keep injecting, I don't think many folks are doing this for the TMJ space, but if you keep injecting, you know, cortisone in those spaces over and over again, by the time you get in there to actually do the treatment, you're going to have a fair amount of damage as a result of those injections. A lot of damage as a result. So, of you know, I like the idea of that. Injections. Yeah. Th there's really in, in, and in the TMJ world, there's not really many people who advocate the yeah. use of steroids. And, and the other problem with it is, is there are very few people who can actually find the superior um, intracapsular space. So, uh, you know, they don't even know where they're putting it a lot yeah, of times. So, exactly. yeah. Bad All thing. right. So how about this? Uh, Suboxone, which is a medication that's been on the market since 2002 to treat opioid addiction. So a lot of folks that found themselves addicted to pain medications um, were prescribed this medication uh, as an alternative to sort of get the body to reset um, and move away from the opioid addiction. Well, in 2000 nine, eight, we'll say somewhere around that time period, they came out with an alternative option of a sublingual or kind of a dissolving tablet film um, that you can take uh, for quick um, intravascular absorption. Well, the uh, adverse effect of that has been significant tooth and dental disease as a result. And so now there are over 300 reported cases with the FDA the FDA has moved forward with a warning label for that classification of drugs. Um, now Suboxone is being sued and the manufacturers of, of the medication are under a lawsuit now from a patient who experienced a severe dental disease as a result of the medication. At that time, there were no warnings on the medication that that could be an intended side effect. And what I thought was really interesting in the article is they actually cited um, that they had seen cases that it occurred as early as two weeks into the use of the product. So that's a pretty rapid onset. And you certainly could then argue that likely that disease process was not present prior if the onset was really that quickly after um, the move to the film uh, dispensing type of Suboxone. So interesting, if you have patients that are on that medication um, and are receiving it through the film or dissolvable tablet form, uh, certainly maybe a conversation like bisphosphonates that we need to be having to give them a heads up on the risk factors associated with that drug, because it is a new warning label attached to it. Uh, I think everyone saw this week that Smile Direct Club filed bankruptcy. Um, I believe it was chapter 11. Um, of course, this is a restructuring. It's it's not um, what everyone would like to see yet, um, but it definitely is a restructuring of, of finances and a strategic move um, to clean the slate a bit so that they can move some debt around. Um, so the company has uh, no indication of shutting down anytime soon. In fact, the founders have given it a $20 million capital injection to hold it over while it's in the bankruptcy period. Um, to make sure that it continues to service the patients that it has and the 110 locations uh, throughout the U.S. of scanning centers that they have for uh, folks to do at-home orthodontics. So that is that. What will come of it? You never really know. And Let's of course, just see what the legal world has to say because yeah. I myself have witnessed many cases that have ended up um, with legal action and absolutely with, with cause. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And then you saw, uh, Mitch Rubenstein posted last night or this morning, and I had seen the news article, actually Brian sent it to me earlier yesterday as well, uh, that Tom Hanks is firing off a pretty, uh, mm -hmm. strong warning against AI generated marketing schemes. And in particular, he was uh, used in AI generation for the marketing of a dental plan, um, which he did not participate in, nor do the audio or uh, recording for. 
but it is pretty darn believable and, and kind of scary. So what that means for the future of marketing and what can you believe and what can you not believe? This is real. I'm here telling you this crappy news every week. And when it gets really, really good, then you should probably get suspicious. It may be AI generated. Last news story for the night, a new scam alert out for medical providers. There are scammers calling medical provider offices stating that they are looking for the doctor either because they missed a court date, which is a pretty common one that we hear of, but more concerning, uh, they're calling stating that they're calling from the local police department because um, they have information to believe that your, F your DEA number is being used in drug trafficking uh, cases in your area. And so uh, obviously any dentist or medical provider would be really concerned to think that their DEA number had been compromised in that way. Um, and I think on top of it, the scammers are using pretty detailed information. They're definitely doing their homework before they call uh, to make it believe and sound like a very true story. So always a good warning to give your front desk a heads up, not to panic, which they like to do from time to time, um, that uh, when those calls come in, take a step back. The FDA or the uh, DEA and the Federal Trade Commission have also encouraged folks to call them directly if you think something may be awry, um, because that would not be their usual mode of operation to reach out to you that way. I will tell you, as a side note, I had a staff member get called and say that her husband was kidnapped and that she needed to go withdraw money. And I mean, what a terrible situation because she suspected that it wasn't real. But then how do you know that it's, do you know what I mean? She felt super stuck because they were incredibly intimidating and scary. She was unsure if her, if her husband wouldn't answer his phone. Um, so she was sort of very much stuck. Um, anyway, it was kind of a heartbreaking story. He's obviously fine um, and was not kidnapped. So anyway, they're definitely out there doing their work. It, with, it amazes me, JB, like how hard people will work at, at scam jobs and not just work that hard at a real job. I know. You, you know, I mean, like some of these things. So I have gotten no less than 10 notices to my office this year about my delinquent property taxes for my dental practice in Horry County. They're all mailed from Dallas or from California. They all have an 800 number, mm. you know, and, and, you know, my sister-in-law happens to be the head of HR for the county. So I'm like, I mean, but it, it, it's really obvious. I think the best piece of advice we could give anyone is never call the phone number on whatever it is that is sent to you. Yep. Never click the link in the email or on the, on whatever has been mailed to you and never assume that what is written on there are the people you should be speaking to. So always go back to the primary source, you know, Absolutely. if it's Horry County, call Horry County when you get the note, uh, you know, it, it, and there's just so many of these things now, but the most disappointing thing for me is, how hard these people will work to develop a scheme that will get some people. But yeah. if they put any of that effort into a real job, they could be the top of the, the industry at whatever really it is could. they do. They really so, could. All right. Anyway, we've got on forever. It's, you know what? I like being on the news with you. I love it. Yeah. Sorry, Chad. Thank you. And great job as always. Thank you. I appreciate so, it. But you know what we've done? You know what we've done wrong? I we've know. left one of the best dentists in the profession in the background for too long. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Nobody puts <laughs> Lon McRae in the corner. So for everyone out there, um, if you don't know Lon McRae, um, I, I got to meet Lon at a uh, meeting where I was going to be lecturing. It was at the American Academy of Dental Implantology. I went out to California to do this meeting. 
And um, it was mostly about implantology. I was doing, I was doing a, a short, uh, I think 30, maybe 45 minute lecture on functional dentistry and sleep and, and the impact that it had on, on implant dentistry and, and treatment planning. And, um, and out there, I met one of their uh, instructors, Dr. Lon McRae. When I met Lon, it was an instant connection because I never have met anyone in the profession that had such a passion, that was such an innovator, and just had such a decent human spirit of wanting to make things better. And, um, you know, I, I could go through a, a traditional introduction, but Lon is an educator. Lon is an innovator. He has taken his dental practice in Boise, Idaho, or in the outskirts of Boise, Idaho, um, to a whole new level that, that we're going to kind of unravel today. Uh, but for those of you who don't know Lon, if you ever get the chance to listen to him, please go see him. Please listen to him. This man is an innovator, and he happens to be one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. Lon, thanks for coming on the show. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you, Jennifer. Good to see you. Uh, Jeff, that was almost By the way, too you, good. you can send over that hundo anytime you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, I think it was too good, so I, I'm, I'm guessing you're completely AI. I've always expected suspected Agreed. that so you know i i don't know i i think there's part in, in there that's definitely some ai for for you jeff but it's good to be with you it, it it's great to have you and so what i want everyone out there to know is um we have all spoken for ada education which is um the american independent dental alliance and and we're all very strong advocates for dentists being able to practice the way that they want to practice and and not to have to succumb to you know what what a lot of dentistry has become which is you know really DSO and and drill and fill and join PPOs and that there are so many ways that we can differentiate ourselves and really be in a class that that very few others are in and, and Lon, nobody has done that better than, than you have in dentistry. So would, would you mind just sharing a little bit about your journey, about your dental practice, and, and how it has been completely transformed from what was a traditional dental practice at one point to really a, a um, multidisciplinary medical dental um, suite. Sure. Yeah. So about five years ago, um, my nephew is a, tried to become a dentist. Um, he took the, the DAT and did really well. He had great grades, but could not get into dental school. He tried two, maybe three years in a row. And so he, he was more like a brother to me. Um, and we did a lot of outdoor stuff, hunting and and he were really kind of best friends. And so he just came to me one day after trying so hard to get into dental school. And he's like, I'm going to, he was a nurse working at the hospital. And he goes, I'm going to become a nurse practitioner. And I go, yeah, that's perfect. So he went and became a nurse practitioner, worked at the hospital for one year. And then I went, why don't you come and let's start a medical practice in my dental practice. And so that's what we did. Um, it was about four years ago, we, we started Mountain West Medical. We just put another name on the building. We didn't hire any new employees, all the same employees. And then he started seeing, we, we thought we had this idea that he would start doing, patients would come in every six months, and then every year he would be doing their physical exams. So we thought that that would just kind of roll. Well, it didn't work. Um, some patients like that, but most patients are very loyal to their GPs and they would go see them. Then they can come see us. So we got into the aesthetic world and boy, did it explode. And we have done, 
he went and learned how to do Botox and he really messed up on a lot of patients. You kind of have to learn to do that. And then I had to teach him how to do Botox. And then he took it to a whole new level. He does. Um, we now have four nurse injectors that work for us and they do all the filler. They do all the Botox. I don't do any of that now. We do more hair transplants than just about anyone in the Northwest. Um, we do liposuction. We do combination cases where we'll take and do life laser assisted liposuction under the chin and we'll end up doing veneers and liposuction under the chin, which we've had some incredible results all at the same time. So we, we've kind of exploded what can be done in the dental office. We do a lot of BBLs, um, basically taking fat from, from the midsection, putting in boobs into butts. I don't do any of that. That all goes to him. But I went and learned all this. I went and learned it because I wanted to be able. Yeah, because I got in trouble for having stirrups in my <laughs> office. I, like I, I had to get rid of them. Like it, that well, was frowned upon by the board. Yeah, but, there's you know. a reason why, Jeff. For you, <laughs> but, that's for sure. but it, it, you have to kind of look at your state and what I. I honestly, when I teach. I can see a day where a nurse practitioner will be in every dental practice. Um, he does all of our surgical consults and it is so how it worked. And th the way we structured it is he's 50% owner. I'm 50% owner. And then we share the profits of the, of what it has done. And within three years, he was doing a million dollars. That's a complete separate um, revenue stream that has really been helpful for our practice. And so he ha does all of our sleep study um, readings. We, we have a sleep study uh, certified doc that she does the sleep study, but that he goes through it with the patient because we want to be able to get medical insurance. And I'm going to tell you, I know dentists can become with the medical insurance. We can become um, uh, what's the uh, in network or. Yes, in network. We can be, what's the word? Verbiage. Preferred um, provider? Or... Yes, but there's a, there's a word. Anyways, he, he, so a dentist can, but it's really difficult for us mm -hmm. to become a preferred provider under medical. And they just don't like to pay us. With, with the way that it works with a nurse practitioner, they just do it through their, their software. Once he's accredited. Once he's accredited with all of the insurance companies, it just, it, it's seamless to be able to get insurance payments. So with sleep, especially that has really helped us, but yeah, that, we've really just scratched the surface of what you can do in a dental practice and we're, we're going all out. Do you see that, um, you feed one another too. So if I come in for an aesthetic consult, that somehow it morphs over to the dental, like how, how for folks that are thinking, Oh, that might be something I would really like to consider in the office. How, how does the co-sharing of patients and how those patients move around? Cause I would assume you're feeding one another, honestly, like you probably attract new patients. He attracts new patients. And then what's that marriage look like internally? Absolutely. So he, he has a big following, especially on Instagram. We, we don't do a lot of um, marketing for Mountain West Medical. So he has a huge following that comes to see his practice for all the different reasons from hair transplants to the facial aesthetics. We have seven facial lasers now um, that we do all the different skin treatments, which are pretty impressive in itself. Um, but what happens is, is they'll come in and they'll go okay, I want the bags underneath my eyes. Well, he, he has been trained now so much with us, he'll talk sleep. And then the next thing you know, they're coming to our practice. We are then doing a sleep assessment, looking at their dental, going through their, their TMJ, looking at uh, a complete sleep assessment. And then, so it's cross-referred all mm -hmm. the time. If we see an issue that the patient says, again, I, I had a, a CEO of um, the largest one of the largest companies in our area, he comes and he goes, Hey, I want my veneers done. And he's been talking for years. I want my veneers done, but man, I really got to lose. I want to lose all this fat underneath my chin. 
I've heard about Kybella. Will it work? And I go, I really don't think, but let's get Dr. John. That's what we call him. Let's get Dr. John to take a look. So he took a look and he goes, no, by far the best thing to do is to do laser assisted liposuction. So we sedated him. I did the veneers. He actually did one side. I did the other side with the, the liposuction. We'd kind of work together because it's kind of strenuous to get it, but it's fairly easy. You know, we, we look at sometimes things like that and go, man, I, that, that just seems like out of our scope. Well, this is our scope, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the way that I look at it. And so it's absolutely, in my opinion, it's our scope and it is so easy to do in reality. I mean, we work in a little box that's dark and we can't see anything. When you're doing a laser assisted liposuction, it is, it's fairly simple. You just have to know the, the anatomy and where to stay away from and learn those things. But well, anyways, who knows the anatomy better than us, Long? It, I mean, that, exactly. that, how many head and neck dissections do we do? How many, I mean, and, and the fact that in a lot of states, they, they give uh, more leeway to um, estheticians than they do to, you know, doctorate degree holders that have dissected 10 heads and have worked in this in this yeah. area at all their lives. And and that's really frustrating. But I, I think it scares a lot of people to kind of go against the board. So I, I guess that's my big question for you is where does the confidence in all of this come from for for a dentist who may want to start working down this pathway of doing more aesthetic work, bringing on a nurse practitioner, bringing on a physician assistant or, or whatever it is, where does a dentist get the confidence to say, oh my God, you know, I can do this and not be afraid of the state dental boards and, and what could potentially happen to them? Well, the first thing that you have to look at is let's just take a nurse practitioner. You have to look at your state and see what is available in your state. There's 30 states out of the 50 states that a nurse practitioner has pretty much the same uh, um, license as a medical doctor. In our state, we really looked at it, went, it, it and it boils down to what is your insurance going to cover? Are they going to cover laser right. assisted liposuction? Well, it took us a while and we found a provider that was able to do it. The, the board of nursing said, they're, they're not going to hold your hand and say, you can't do this. It's really, it's the same with dentistry. If you can get coverage with your medical license and your medical malpractice insurance to be able to do Botox and filler, of course, the board, most of the states are going to say, we're not going to tell you yes or no. It's going to be whether your insurance is going to cover. Well, there you. are some boards that will tell you yes or no, or will try well, to. Trust yeah. me, you know that. And there's, yeah. there's, there's what, 20 states that say nurse practitioners basically can't do anything without a medical director right in the state of idaho and 30 other states they say okay we're going to give you autonomy you can go ahead and do that why do i like nurse practitioners because one they they work really well within a dental community they they're they're usually working from a hospital they have great skills um anyways i i my first thing I would do is look at a nurse practitioner. I would look at the state laws, see what is in your state. Then the next thing I would do is, okay, what do we need to learn? What, what do we want to do within our practice? Do you want to go into the aesthetic world? We do so much implants and cosmetics. It just works really well within our practice. You might say, I only want to focus on sleep. Get a nurse practitioner that's going to be, help, be able to help you with the medical reimbursement insurance reimbursement and get it something like that. Um, that's the first thing I, I would look at. Let's talk with your team. Here's the other thing that's nice. The team loves it. Mm -hmm. They love to be cross trained and to be able to say, okay, we're doing hair transplants. Oh, by all means, let's, let's go into that. We've had it. I mean, we've expanded. We've got two nurses. We've got four injectors. So it's really expanded beyond what we even thought where we were going to start. Um, but I really think that we're just scratching the surface of what is possible and where we can go 
with this medical dental model and to be able to utilize each other and then cross refer, like you said. And the other thing that's really, in fact, Jeff, you talked about this. Why is dentists, we are so afra afraid to refer. We just are. In the medical community, boy, they refer left and right. It's, it's, it's not something, I mean, it's just something that they do. But for us, we don't want to give up any patient. So it's nice because he gets referrals from other medical providers all the time. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's the truth. So the, the other side of this, Lon, is how, how, how do we, what, what is the first step in moving in this direction? Because I think it goes way beyond aesthetics. I think the whole orosystemic connection has become really a huge topic in dentistry. And we notice things medically about patients way before many of the physicians do. Um, and, and likewise, I think there are patients that don't engage with dentistry that the physicians could be sending to us to, to help reduce inflammation and, and things like that. Where, where do you see, as, what do you see as the entry point? Because we have a lot of listeners and everyone's like, oh, you know, you're in a whole different league or you practice in a whole different area. Or that, that wouldn't work for me. What, what do you see as the entry point to this medical dental crossover and, and starting on a path towards, um, it, I hate to use the word enlightenment, but but opening your practice to more services and and uh, opportunities like what you've done. Well, I think the first thing is, is do you have a desire to to look at that? Are you are you busting at the seams right now in your dental? So if you've got a, a two chair office, is that going to work to bring someone in potentially on the hours that you're not there? In our case, we had eight operatories. We've now, we've looked at every single space we could and we've gained what, four more operatories. So we looked at, you have to look at your space. Then the next thing is, is who would be the individual in your state? Can you get a nurse practitioner, which I would highly recommend. Second is, is it, would it be um, to the point where if you didn't couldn't get a nurse practitioner to do, be autonomous, what would it take for a medical director and, a, and an MD to work with that nurse practitioner? So there's always ways to be able to look at being able to do that. So that, that would be the next thing that I would look at. I would look at your state laws. I would look at your team. Would your team be interested? And then what are the extra services that you potentially can do with a nurse practitioner or a nurse practitioner under a medical director and say, what are the things that we're not providing for our patients? Do you do a lot of surgery? Um, if you're doing a ton of surgery, every single patient could absolutely use a surgical screening prior to surgery. I'll give you an example. We had a patient come in. He was, what was he? He was um, in his 40s. He needed four teeth extracted. He needed four implants. Um, sent him for a surgical screening. He marked that everything was healthy. Next thing you know, his blood sugar was 340. Um, he was a, I mean, he was diabetic. I mean, a raging diabetic. He had no clue how bad it was. And so if we would have done the surgery, here's what would have happened. We would have done the surgery. We would have placed the implants, potentially doing our all-in system. And then most likely they would have failed because mm -hmm. we, didn't, didn't, we didn't know. Going into this, now we knew, okay, we got to go much slower. We got to let everything heal and be able to get his blood sugar under control before we ever even do any type of surgery. So they will save us over and over again if we just utilize them. Do you use, um, are you doing your own sedation line or do you use the medical model and the sedation piece of that as well? We do both. We, um, the majority of our cases, we do, I do the sedation. Um, I've been doing it for 20 plus years. 
But if it's a tough case or it's a long case, then we bring in a nurse anesthetist. And so if we're doing an all on four almost every time or all on six, we're almost always bringing in a nurse practitioner or a, a nurse anesthetist. So here's a debated question in aesthetics quite frequently, numbing patients for filler procedures, because they are pretty uncomfortable. And um, a lot of patients will re report a tremendous amount of discomfort. Some clinicians are in favor of anesthesia, local anesthesia for those appointments. Some are not for aspiration issues, like um, to, to tell if we've got a vascular uh, injection or not. Where are you guys on that? And are you utilizing that as a added benefit of, of having this collaborative workspace? The majority of what we do is um, with the filler, especially is that your numbing cream is nowadays is really good. You, okay. you, most of the time you do not need to do pre numbing. Now around the orbital area, we all know that that yeah. can be very tender and two injections right over the canines can take away all of that. So I had to teach him how to be able to do it. Now that is something that he does routinely um, if, if the patient wants it. So yes, it's, it's really case dependent, but the majority of the time around the orbital area, because it is so tender, he'll give just a little bit of um, lidocaine there, take away that pain. It's pretty yeah. easy. Nice. Yep. So in addition to that, you do a fair amount of implant dentistry. And I think one of the things you lecture on a fair amount as well. Um, so I'm, I'm genuinely curious, what does a day in the life look like for Lon and his dental practice? Because it sounds like you could be incredibly busy and, you know, my dog is being totally stupid. Um, it could be really busy or, uh, you know, disorienting a little bit. So I'm curious to see what a day in the life looks like. I love your dog, by the way. Well, yeah, well, she's being ridiculous <laughs> right now. Well, my wife's cat, kitten, I have to say my wife's kitten, was was um, chewing on my feet this whole time. So, yeah, I tried to flush <laughs> me. Um, and I was literally trying to kick it across the room and it would just attack even more. So, oh, um, you, you know, we do a lot of implants. We do a lot of aesthetics. The, I think the main thing is, is having a good team around you that can take all of the other things that, that, so you can really focus. Well, the thing I hate the most as a general dentist doing big implant cases is happening to go and do exams while I'm in surgery. Oh, yes. That, I mean, it's like, yes, like, no, yes. <laughs> You know, it, 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 it doesn't matter if it's an implant case. It doesn't matter if it's a big crown and bridge case. It doesn't matter what it is. When yeah. you're in the zone, you don't want to get up. Yeah. I mean, the oral surgeons don't have to. The periodontist usually doesn't yeah. have to. But boy, we, it's like, and then the hygienist is just sitting at the door. They really need <laughs> to see you. They've asked to see you. And it's like, right. do you see all of the blood on my hand? Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> like, oh my goodness. I am knee deep into this right so we we've worked on that we've hired more associates it's um that's been helpful to to a big degree but no i'm i'm a general dentist i do a tremendous amount of implants we started this new concept called all in um which that's most of what i teach about is the all in concept i can tell you about that a little bit later but i yes i do my own exams most of the time i still do fillings here and there i hate it i don't want to you know at three o'clock in the afternoon to see a 12 year old girl that doesn't want me to get her numb and i have to do yeah. three or four do's yeah but we do a lot of airway i do a lot of tongue tie releases um a lot of infants so i i do a lot a lot of different things i think that's what's cool about being a general dentist though is that you know, you get to diversify your portfolio of skills and, and clinical things that you enjoy. Um, and so you can make your day an enjoyable day versus like, you know, specialists that are really honed in on one specific area or procedure like an endodontist. Um, there's Hi, not Dr. a lot of variety. McCray. It's your 12th root canal today. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that sounds like misery, but I'm sure people love doing them. How I, do your fingers feel? No. 
Well, um, you know, and that brings up a, that brings up a good point, though, about General Dennis. If you look at, and in, in fact, in Europe, do you know what the percentage of General Dennis that do that place the implants in in <laughs> Europe? What's that percentage? Guess. Guess what the 80%. percentage of implants placed? Eighty percent. It's eighty to ninety percent. What is it in the U.S.? I, I knew it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, What's in the U.S. It's by US? thirty. Ten to fifteen percent. Oh wow! Wow. So you bring up a good point. We have all these skills that we continue to grow, and I think majority of implants should be placed by a general dentist. We have the skills to be able to do it. We just have to be able to be, and that's where the all-in concept, basically what the all-in concept is, is you make sure how, how this works. You take a CBCT, you, take, you scan the patient, you take photos, you send it into the right designer, you sit down with the designer, you go through and literally do the surgery completely um, online. Everything is pre-planned. And I have never seen a more accurate way of placing implants ever. So when you're done, we always seal the socket. Now, the, the average molar is 10 millimeters. The average implant is five millimeters. We have this huge space. Yeah. And so the one and done concept where we take the tooth out, place it, but then you have this huge area that has to heal. So what we've created is a a way to be able to seal the socket with the final abutment and those, and it literally seals it. Or if you don't have enough torque on the implant, you're finishing that with a final zirconium healing abutment and you're waiting for that to heal. It completely seals the socket. I used to have to stuff PRF in there mm -hmm. or use a huge healing abutment that was or not graft. custom or graft. I mean, it was, well, right. and we, you see you, you're grafting, but then once you seal that, here's what we're finding. When you can seal the socket completely, the amount of pain that the patient feels is, I mean, I literally have all the time patients go, doc, I don't know that I've even feel anything. It might be a one on a pain scale. So this is what we're finding when you can seal that socket. And what better material than zirconia to do that? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So we yeah. were going to seal it with, with a final zirconium abutment or a, a custom healing abutment that you're still going to have the final custom abutment that you're going to be able to take your custom healing abutment off in four months, put your final custom healing about or final abutment on, take a traditional impression. It looks like a tooth that's been prepped. Um, patients love being able to leave with a tooth that day. And we're doing a majority of our cases Patients are leaving with their final abutment, never to be touched again. And in fact, they, they talked about this a, a lot about the um, hemidesmosome area and the, the fibers that attach to your, your healing abutments. And what the new research is showing is that, that, I mean, think about this. You take, we place the implant. Well, normal is you take the tooth out, you let it heal for four to six months. You then go in, second surgery, place the implant, place your healing abutment. Then everything heals to that healing abutment. Another three, four, six months. We then rip that healing abutment out, all the fibers that are potentially have attached. We take an impression, we put an impression coping in. Even though it's only in there maybe 15 minutes to 30 minutes, it still has starting to attach. Do we get a new healing abutment when we go and say, okay, now we're going to send this to the lab? We don't. We then take that same healing abutment, put it back in. It reheals. Then two weeks later, we rip it again. So that's three rips. We then, we then put the final abutment back in, okay, or final abutment, and then we put our crown on. Or it's, let's just say it's a screw retain. What we end up with is three to four rips. They say that potentially we only get five and it will never rip. You'll never get attachment again. So this one and done concept, I think, is really starting to take effect. And, and, and implantologists are understanding how to be able to finish and finish these cases. Implant companies are doing it. Nobel has their on one and their N one. 
um, where you you put a on one abutment and never take off again. I think um, Strawman has their their implants where it is a periodontal uh, polished surface, so it can be above the the bone crest. So they're they're looking at these so to try to make sure that we can get initial fiber attachment that is never to be removed. So Lon, a, a couple of points to everything you said. First, when someone goes in and gets a knee replacement or a hip replacement, what do they do? They put a, a weight on it immediately, <laughs> right? Yep. And and they're not going in and disrupting the healing that has gone on already. And it has been proven that this works. So why we have this concept that we need to keep going in and interrupting that, that inflammatory process and the healing process, I've never understood. And actually, you've helped me understand that probably better than anyone. The other thing is, is dentists have been placing posts in teeth forever. It is harder to place a post well than it is to place an implant well. Why are so many dentists in the U.S. afraid to learn the concepts of how to do that? Because you've already been placing posts. If you can put a post in a tooth and do that well, you could place an implant in bone and do that well. And, and I think when you're able to control the restorative side of it and know how many times that, that inflammatory process is going to be interrupted, I, I think we have so much more control than, than we are aware of. And, um, and, and so I just, I appreciate everything you're talking about very, very much. Well, so that's been the question. I've asked this it, uh, countless audiences. Why is it that we are so afraid as, and I'll say, how many are placing implants? And it usually, I'd said is the 10 to 15% range. It's usually only 5% raise their hand. 5% is what I'm usually getting the audiences when I'm, when I'm speaking. And I think, and, I, and so we ask, and you know what it boils down to? Dental schools teach, do not place implants. They teach that. That needs to go to the oral surgery department. That needs to go to the periodontal department. And so I think that's the first thing. I think the implant companies, especially the two big ones, they used to not even sell to the general dentist. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that we are a litigious society. And so we're so afraid of being sued. That's why I am a big advocate of making sure that every almost, I can't even tell you the last time I did a implant without a surgical guide. And, and this is the most accurate surgical guide that I've seen on the market is the all in concept, because you can index exactly where you have planned. I have tried many different systems. This is, I think it's better than even um, a robot or guided, um, uh, for, uh, the guided systems that they have X guide, I think is what it's called. This is good. This is going to blow that away because it, it, it goes almost exactly where you're, you have planned it. You index the depth, the rotation of that, um, implant, and then your abutment goes directly on. And when it, everything fits, and then you can take a PMMA, that you have pre-planned and it fits perfectly, man, that is just a good feeling. It's like, okay, everything went exactly where we want. Now, what's the caveat to that? You need at least 40 Newton centimeters of torque to be able to put a final abutment on. If you don't, let's say you got 20, that's where you, you have your custom healing abutment and you can put that right on. Everything is already pre-planned for you. We even have a way to be able to say um, partial extraction therapy where you're gonna do a socket shield. We have a surgical guide that you can place and be able to put, be able to go right down that tooth and it makes this, the, the PET so much easier. 
Um, there's going to be, we've have surgical guides that you can remove the tissue correctly, exactly where it needs to be with, a, with a laser. We also have, um, a surgical guide that let's say you're molar and you've got to remove that molar and you want to preserve all the bone. So we will give you a sectioning guide that gives you an exact depth to go into the furcation. You'll have three different two millimeter drills that you'll go into that furcation. You just connect the dots. And then you can take both of the roots out. And it is the most atraumatic way that I've seen to be able to remove, remove that tooth. So this is all the things that we're working on with the, the, this all-in concept I, for the general I, dentist. That's right. I love this so much. And I think you're right. There is, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for doctors out there to be able to do this. And quite frankly, um, you know, having participated in the referral process and doing implants and sending implants out and dealing with whatever shows right back up again and, and be, then being stuck in the middle of failures when things go wrong, whose fault is it? You know, and everybody's looking for someone to blame. Is it the surgeon who, you know, is it the implant? Is it the surgeon? Is it the restorative doctor? Is it the lab components that they say? Like it's all, all of that messy stuff gets cleaned up pretty quickly uh, when it's all under one roof and you can sort of just take, you either take ownership of it or you don't. That, that, um, exactly. And the, and the patients don't want to go anywhere else. They want to right. stay in your practice. Well, Lon. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. It's been great. Uh, sorry, we're running short on time. And uh, actually, I don't know if you happen to be around for a bit, but we have a couple questions. If you, if you want to take a few mo moments to ping off a few I'm answers sure. for the folks that were watching because we didn't have a chance to go over them. But again, always a pleasure. Hopefully I will get to meet you in person someday. Like everybody else has had the opportunity. Maybe you've not met Lon yet. Mm -mm. No. Oh, right. I'm the best we're, we're kept secret of things. This, so. this, this is my quest is, is to put yes, these two great an alignment minds together. Must occur. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, really appreciative that you took your evening to spend with us. Um, and I, I'm so appreciative of all the knowledge that you shared. I hope that you'll also share with us, maybe take the next few minutes and let us know where you're going to be next, because I'm sure folks who are listening to Unite would really like to find a few of your courses to learn more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right now I'm working mostly with a company called Biotech. You can go to their website, their education. Um, the next one I think is in Indianapolis. No, no. Uh, the next one is in um, San Antonio, Texas. I, I, I don't know exact the exact date, but San well, Antonio. Well, feel free to send us then, whatever you know. if you want any promotional material, and we'll share it with our audience so that they can. You find will be you. somewhere in the world talking about implants. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we know that. All right, well, Nate, this, thanks this, so much for joining us tonight, and uh, you know we really appreciate you always spending your Wednesdays with us. And remember, you can always catch a recap of the show on YouTube or podcast uh, channel. And uh, we're heading to SmileCon. So if you're going to be in the area, please stop by the Podcasting Hub on Saturday. We'll be there from 30 to 2.30. Have a great night. Have a great night. Lon, thank you. Love you, brother. Have a good night. Love you too, man. Yeah. And that wraps up another podcast for Dennis in the Know. On behalf of Dr. Jennifer Bell, Dr. Chad Duplantis, and myself, remember that we've got a great profession, so let's make it a great day, dinks.